Um, the slides will also be shared uh, with you by email. Um, so this evening, we're going to have an overview of the proposed Mount Kemble development. Um, there will be 96 condos, including 16 affordable units on 15 acres of land in total. 9.3 acres are going to be uh, part of the construction. Um, it's located between the Mount Kemble Corporate Center and Route 287. Uh, it's in Harding, but access to the site is off of Route 202 through the corporate park. The project is directly upstream from the Great Swamp Watershed Association Conservation Management Area, which is located on Tiger Lily Lane. The properties are only separated by Route 287. Great Swamp Watershed Association has very specific concerns, environmental concerns related to water quality and quantity, which will be explained by our speakers this evening. The purpose of tonight's meeting is to provide information about the proposed development, explain Great Swamp Watershed Association's concerns, and prepare for the DEP Zoom hearing, which will be on March, actually it's not Zoom, I think it's Teams, but it's not in person, uh, on March 9th from 2 to 4 p.m. So this evening we're going to hear from Elliot Ruga. He's the Policy and Communications Director at the Highlands Coalition. Steve Souza, he is an environmental consultant hired by GSWA and president of Clean Water Consulting. Hazel England, GSA D Director of Education and Outreach and Land Steward, uh, as well as Sandra Levine, GSWA Director of Water Quality Programs. At the end of the meeting, we'll explain how to join the March 9th DEP hearing and how to submit your comments. We're very grateful for your participation and your interest this evening. We want to be respectful of your time, so we hope to wrap this up in an hour, but we will stay on and answer as many questions as are submitted, but our goal is to keep it to an hour. Uh, please post all of your questions in the chat, which will be moderated by staff at GSWA, who will facilitate the questions to the appropriate speaker at the end of the presentation. Now I'm going to turn it over to our first speaker, who's Elliot Ruga. Thank you, Sally. Let me get my um, screen going here. From the beginning, Genesis. So what is this all about? What is KRE attempting to get approved? Um, they're, they're, they want to establish a new sewer service area, which is ad immediately adjacent to one that currently exists, and they want to expand it. Uh, in order to do that, it goes through the water quality management planning program rules which are a very comprehensive set of planning rules um, that, that um, help the state plan wastewater and to meet certain um, uh, federal um, Clean Water Act standards. A lot of things roll into um, water quality management plans. And those rules are located at the New Jersey Administrative Code, Title Seven, Section 15. Uh, you can go to the DEP website, download the whole 65 pages rule package, but um, the approval or the extension of a sewer service area is just one portion of that rule package. Um, not only do they delineate sewer service areas, they also provide how, to, how an applicant can rebut a um, um, the presence of habitat for um, threatened endangered species and species of, of concern. Um, it's also where uh, TMDLs, total maximum daily loads, um, are, are specified for different waters for discharges of um, um, treatment plants. And they also give watershed management grants and a, and a few other things. So 
New Jersey is divided up into about a dozen um, area-wide water quality management plans. And um, this, this applicant is in, under the jurisdiction of the Northeast Water Quality Management Plan. And these are set plans that have a lot of different moving parts. Um, to amend one of these plans is, is, is a rule change. Uh, normally, if, it, if it's merely a permit, um, it will be something that's noticed in the DEP bulletin. But these to amend a fixed sewer service area, which is an area where um, there isn't currently sewer service allowed, uh, they want they want to be able to use sewers and sewer in an area. Um, it, it is a rule change, which is very complicated. It is something that has to go through um, um, the New Jersey Register, um, and there's a very prescribed public comment involvement in this. So this is where your participation is is really really important, and. Um, the commenting is really twofold. I mean, congrat congratulations that we got a uh, public hearing. You, you have to demonstrate a threshold of public interest before they do that. But that puts DEP on the alert that people are watching. Sometimes, um, you know, if no one really cares, they'll, they'll rubber stamp it. But if people are watching, they'll be much more careful about and approval of, of something of this of, of this magnitude and comments that um, th there are technical comments people are really responding to the substantive provisions of the rules but people who aren't um, specialists or experts are welcome to comment but we're going to try to help you um, provide comments that may not be experts but but show the department that you're concerned and you're concerned about the right things relevant to these rules. So let's take a look at the public notice, which was published in the Federal Register, or the New Jersey Register. And this, out, this outlines what the substance, substantive um, um, things that the applicant has to satisfy. And they lay it right out here. Um, these are the following uh, um, situations or conditions that are that the department will not delineate a sewer service area, um, except with some exceptions. Number one is our environmentally sensitive areas, which are any contiguous areas of 25 acres or or larger, the, the, the development doesn't have to be 25 acres, but the environmentally sensitive area that it's part of has to be 25 acres or larger. Um, and it's any of the following alone or in com combination um, conditions, endangered or threatened wildlife species habitat, which there are, have been identified on this site. So that's important. Natural heritage priority sites, which is um, are really rare plants. Um, there are none identified for this site, I understand. So that's not really a concern. Riparian zones of category one waters, that, that 300 foot buffer and their tributaries, which I don't believe this have been identified on this property or wetlands, which I think this is mostly any of the development is occurring outside of wetlands or coastal planning areas. This is not a coastal planning area or environmentally sensitive areas subjects to a 201 facilities grant condition, which is rare. Um, 40 years ago, the federal government gave grants to municipalities to expand their sewer treatment plants or improve them under the condition that they won't develop in certain areas. And that would limit their, their development potential as a condition of getting these grants. Um, so Harding Township or Morris Township, neither of them are subject to any of these. So that doesn't apply. But uh, uh, about the 
threatened and endangered and special concerned species habitat, they have been located. And here is the provision in the public notice that discusses it. The department has determined that the proposed sewer service area contains areas mapped as endangered or threatened wildlife species habitat rank five for the northern myotis, which is a bat, the Indiana bat, and wood turtle. Um, and they've been verified on the department's landscape maps of habitat for these species. And in accordance with their rules regarding this, the applicant submitted a habitat habitat in, uh, a habitat impact assessment uh, prepared according to certain rules. The department concurred that the amendment area will result in insignificant and or discountable impacts to the maintenance of local breeding, nesting, or feeding of the endangered or threatened species. They always say that. Um, I believe uh, Emil DeVito will be talking about the actual impacts to these identified um, species where breeding pairs, I believe, have been, um, have been verified on the site. So that's going to be an important part of where you may be able to comment. Another aspect where we believe this um, development may be vulnerable is, is its applicability of Executive Order 114. And this was something that was issued when the, when the Highlands Master Plan was um, adopted in 2008. Governor Corzine issued this executive order. And the relevant provisions are the last two of them, um, items number nine and 10. And um, item no, provision number nine specifies that the DEP shall take appropriate action to ensure that no water allocation permit is issued. And this development, any residential development or most commercial developments require a water allocation permit. Um, if it, if it is located in the protection zone, the conservation zone, or the environmentally constrained subzone as delineated in the Highlands Plan or within a HUC 14, which is a size of a subwatershed that is in or anticipated to be in a deficit of net water availability as, I, as identified in the Highlands Plan until such a time that a municipal water use and conservation management plan that we call a WUCUMP, um, consistent with the policies in the Highlands plan has been approved by the Highlands, Highlands Council and has been fully implemented. And pretty much the same thing goes for an approval of a water quality management plan amendment, which this is uh, will be if it's approved. It's a amendment to the Northeast Water Quality Management Plan under the same circumstances in a, in a subwatershed that is recognized by the Highlands to be in deficit, it has to have a, um, has to satisfy the conditions of a municipal water use and conservation management plan consistent with the policies of, in, of the Highlands and having been approved by the Highlands Council and have been fully implemented. This municipality or this project is located in a subwatershed that is in deficit of net water availability. Net water availability is a very conservative calculation of the available water in a uh, available for for use in, in a subwatershed. And it means that over time, um, given the ecological needs of the rivers and streams and, and what lives on the surface, that eventually um, they will run out of water. 
And so you can see in the center of this map is the project site. And you can see from the legend that this is in a, a deficit of between um, 0.99 and 0 0.10 million gallons a day of deficit. Actually, I can the, the the real figure, the specific figure for this site is they're in a deficit of 0 0.941. So just under 1 million gallons a day. And that triggers the apl applicability of executive order 114. And the Highlands Council has commented on this in um, their consistency determination to, um, to DEP. This is really a interagency um, process. And this consistency determination was written in the March, in March of 2022. And they found under, they have found it to be consistent with, um, with the Highlands Regional Master Plan. And an important, an important point is that the applicability of Executive Order 114 is for the entire Highlands region, regardless of a municipality's uh, conformance status. Um, Morris Township is not a conforming municipality, but this provision of the regional master plan still applies according to this executive order. So this lays out the conditions that uh, the applicant must follow in order to be approved. And this is actually a two-part um, um, letter, consistency determination. This is the recent one written, this is an updated one, rich, written in March of 2022. There was an earlier one in April 22nd, uh, 2021. If someone wants to comment on this aspect of the, of the approval process, it would be a good idea to get a hold of this letter and, and we could make it available to you. But the conditions that they lay out have to do with um, that they are drawing well water. Um, they're going to be on city water provided by Southeast Morris Municipal Utilities Authority, but that well is in the same subwatershed as the project. And the wastewater, which eventually the water will become part of, um, is not going to be returned to the same subwatershed it's going to be transferred to the woodland treatment plant, which discharges to another subwatershed, and that is a depletive use of of water, which is going to, if not addressed, is going to further exacer exacerbate the deficit uh, that that currently is in uh, is the situation with the subwatershed, and that is unacceptable. If so the Highlands Council has conditioned that certain things have to occur. Um, there are indoor conservation measures. Uh, the applicant commits, well, who's going to make sure that they're going to do this? There is no, there is no enforcement um, as part of this condition, which is a problem. Um, they commit to the installation of low flow, high efficiency plumbing fixtures and appliances for the entire development, including water faucets, washing machines, dishwashers, showers, and toilets. I thought that if, if well, if Morris Township has already requires these low flow appliances as a matter of law, then they're really not saving anything by installing these measures. Um, other conditions are the applicant commits to utilizing Energy Star compliant clothing, washing machines, and dishwashers. I don't know who, who's going to enforce that and what are they really saving if that's required anyway. Um, there are certain stormwater requirements. And uh, I know Steve Souza is going to talk about 
uh, stormwater management, is this consistent with, uh, is this really saving what they say they have to, they have to um, mitigate for I think 59,000 gallons per day through these measures, plus outdoor conservation me measures. So uh, very basically, a comment would be, who is going to enforce these mitigation measures to make sure that they occur? And do they really save, um, do they really mitigate for the depletive use of water? And that's something that could be calculated and challenged. And according to Executive Order 114, each one of these provisions, the last sentence says that the municipal water use and conservation plan has to be approved and have been fully implemented. As of now, they've only agreed to do a water use and conservation management plan. It has not been fully implemented. They're a long way off and they are not according to this executive order, approve the amendment until it's fully implemented. So that's, in a, that's, a, that's a very vulnerable part of this approval process. And I think something that they're vulnerable, vulnerable about. So that's an introduction to the water quality management plan rule, uh, how it applies to this uh, project and where we think they might be vulnerable by furthering the water deficit that has been identified by the Highlands Council. And I guess if there are questions, I'll take them at, at the end. Sally, is that the way we're going to do this? Yes, we're going to take questions at the end. They can uh, People can put them into the chat and they will reach us directly. And now we're going to go to um, Steve Sousa, but uh, we're gonna, um, Steve, if you want to get going, Sandra will share her screen with your slides. So I'm gonna pick up on a little bit where uh, Elliot left off, but in addition to that, uh, what I'm gonna be talking about are some of the water quality and ecological uh, and environmental impacts that uh, we've identified with this project. So, um, yeah, Sarah, uh, or Sandra rather, uh, could you go ahead and initiate the, uh, the slideshow? Okay, so um, Elliot and uh, Sally earlier identified the location of this project site. Um, as proposed, um, this project will increase the volume of runoff that's uh, entering Silver Brook. It's going to increase the frequency that flood flows are experienced in Silver Brook. It's going to increase the amount of time or the duration that those flood flows are occurring in Silver Brook. It will also increase the pollutant load to Silver Brook. That includes sediment phosphorus and nitrogen, which I, you all know are responsible for algae blooms, as well as heavy metals and petroleum hydrocarbons. And because of some of the construction activity, it's going to result in direct physical disturbance of wetlands and wetland buffers that are adjacent to the project site. In total, that's pretty bad news for, Sil for the Silverbrook ecosystem, and that includes wood turtle habitat, as Elliot noted, uh, that is located immediately down gradient of this project site. For those of you that have properties uh, within the Silverbrook ecosystem, uh, down gradient of the site, that means there's potential increase for flooding and scouring of those downstream properties. Go to the next slide, please. Okay, but yeah, any of you that have been following this development, you know that the applicant has proposed various types of stormwater management measures. And yes, I'll be the first to agree that the uh, measures that have been proposed by the applicant do meet 
New Jersey DEP's post-development peak flow mitigation requirements. And I'm emphasizing peak flow mitigation because that is a lot different than decreasing volume. So think about a cup of uh, a coffee cup filled with water and a gallon jug filled with water. Well, I can empty that gallon jug at the same rate that I'm emptying that coffee cup. So the rate or the flow is the same, but obviously the volume is much different. So at this particular project site, the woodlands are gonna be replaced by rooftops, hardscape, pavement, lawn, compacted soils. That all means more runoff, less opportunity for precipitation to soak into the ground, more potential for runoff. In addition, because of the development of the site, uh, clearing, grading, et cetera, the original flow paths or the existing flow paths that are out there for stormwater uh, that allows a lot of that stormwater to sheet flow over the majority of the site, that's all gonna be concentrated now at two discharge points. So yes, although the runoff rate will be controlled, the total volume of runoff that's produced by every storm will increase. And with that comes the increased potential for downstream flooding and a variety of other water quality uh, and habitat related impacts. You can go to the next slide. Okay. And then, yeah, I'd be the first to agree that the applicant has proposed a number of stormwater best management practices. However, there's two things to keep in mind here, is that number one, the regulations in the best management practices manual doesn't say that the pollutant load needs to be reduced from a proposed condition to what it was prior to development. It just says that post-development, there is a need to decrease pollutant load by given quantities. So at the end of the day, even with the best implemented and constructed and maintained stormwater best management practices, we are still going to see a 10 to 20% increase in total suspended solids. And remember, this is post-development, not compared to pre-development. So an increase of 10 to 20% in total suspended solids, an increase of 40% in total phosphorus, an increase in 70% in total nitrogen, and because DEP does not require or has not ascribed rather pollutant removal efficiencies on BMPs for heavy metals and petroleum hydrocarbons or pesticides, there's going to be an unknown increase in those pollutants. And given the fact that right now the site is undeveloped, obviously uh, there is going to be a much greater amount of those pollutants uh, being generated and transported uh, to Silver Brook, even with all these best management practices that are being implemented. So once again, that's bad news for the water quality and the biota of Silverbrook. There's also going to be a reduction in base flow. So this is the flip side of the coin. You know, so a lot of times when we think about development, we think about what that does in terms of increasing flooding. However, if you decrease the amount of precipitation that soaks into the ground and feeds that surficial aquifer, which is essentially like a big sponge, that means on a daily basis, there's less base flow to Silver Brook. Less base flow, once again, detrimental to the biota, particularly wood turtle, various fish life, fish fauna, aquatic insects, and that further stresses water quality. As Elliot pointed out, this is further compounded, this, de uh, this decrease in base flow by the fact that the well water, well, the wells rather, that are being used to draw potable water for the development, the allocation is occurring in one watershed, but it's being discharged into another watershed. So that's about 27,000 gallons a day that is being transported out of the Silver Brook watershed. So that's a daily deficit that further decreases Silver Brook's base flow. And as Elliot pointed out, Executive Order 114 states that a water allocation permit cannot be issued under such circumstances 
until a municipal water use and conservation man plan, management plan that's consistent with the Highland plan has been prepared and approved by the Highland Council. That is yet to be uh, achieved. Next slide, please. Okay. So let's think about now all that wastewater that is being generated. And this is the reason for the need for this water quality management plan uh, amendment. Uh, we're going to be increasing the amount of treated wastewater to the tune of about 27,000 gallons a day that's discharged to the Wanaka Brook and Kitchell Pond, uh, both of which are part of the Wanaka Reservation. The Wanaka Brook is, also, is already impaired, and that is documented in the state's 2020-303D list, which is their list of streams that do not meet water quality requirements as specified by not only the state, but by the EPA. The typical phosphorus concentration that is discharged from that treatment plant is around 0 0.2 to 0 0.4 milligrams per liter, and at times even higher. But even at the, these lower concentrations, that's five to 10 times the concentration of phosphorus that's needed to stimulate an algae bloom. And any of you that have gone out to Kitchell Pond during the summer, you know that pond already experiences intense algae blooms. And that includes cyanobacteria dominated harmful algae blooms. Great Swamp Watershed Association has been testing uh, that stream for over a decade. Uh, and we have been able to document water quality impairments. More of this is gonna be discussed later on uh, by uh, both Hazel and Sandra. Move on to the next slide, please. Okay, so with all that, essentially we know that this added sewage flow is going to trigger the need for that water quality management plan amendment that Elliot had noted. And as he pointed out, there's a number of things that need to be done. One of the things that needs to be done is that the applicant needs to perform an anti-degradation analysis in accordance with the anti-degradation policies of the state's surface water quality standards. That's NJC 7 colon 9B. And what that analysis is required to demonstrate is that there'll be no measurable change in the water quality of the receiving stream, that being the Wanaka Brook. If the analysis does conclude that there's gonna be a measurable change in water quality, the applicant must justify then that what they're doing and the proposed lowering of that existing water quality uh, is acceptable. So bottom line is that they just can't make things worse. So what we're saying here is that there is the need to conduct these various analyses. These various analyses are being conducted not only to enable the applicant to receive an approval to uh, uh, ship more uh, uh, wastewater to the plant, but it also needs to be done to document that there's not going to be an adverse impact to the Wawanica Brook uh, receiving system, and that includes Kitchell Pond. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over uh, to uh, Sandra and Hazel, and they'll pick up uh, where I've left off. So thank you. And I will be here to take questions later on. So I'll let me just get my screen sharing. And there we go. There we go. So um, I'm going to start by, you know, we've talked a little bit about the location, um, but just to show the relationship between this proposed development parcel and our conservation management area, or CMA as we call it and how they're geographically and hydrologically related. So um, the proposed development is, is upstream from our conservation management area, but as proposed, um, Silverbrook or Catfish Brook will be the recipient of um, the flows um, as currently laid out and talked about by Steve, flowing you know, onto the proposed wetlands or onto the wetlands and then um, across underneath 287, across the wetlands of the adjacent property, 
and then on to the conservation management area. So Silver Brook um, flows through the entire conservation management area. And then another portion of the development, the easternmost edge, you can see that some of the flow will actually go under 287 in another culvert. And that culvert um, pops out just at the end of Tiger Lily Lane. And that flow also makes its way onto the conservation management area. So over the last 20 years, we've worked really hard at GSWA to manage and steward this floodplain forest and to use it for education, for passive recreation, as a source of biodiversity. We're using it for research, with research being carried out long-term by Drew, by Rutgers University, and by Raritan Valley and others, and also for flood storage and mitigation. The site is primarily um, deciduous forest with um, pinocchio and maple. There's many areas of wetlands and vernal pool. And as has been mentioned before, it's you know invaluable um, habitat for uh, wood turtle. The Silver Brook is also known as the Catfish Brook, is a tributary to the to the Great Brook. And so water leaving our property, we've been spending the last two decades trying to improve its water quality um, with the restoration, the um, you know, revegetation of the site, exclusion of deer causing um, problems. And then after it leaves us, the uh, Silverbrook flows through the Harding Land Trust property and on down into the Great Swamp National Wildlife Refuge. So in 2020, after almost 10 year process of permitting and planning, um, we worked with the U.S. Department of Agriculture, the Natural Resources Conservation Service, to complete a huge restoration at the site. And this federally funded enhancement and ecological restoration had three main aims, um, all of which um, were stated to have been completed. So we were looking to increase the water holding capacity at the site by plugging man-made ditches, which drain to the Silver Brook, to de-channelize the Silver Brook, which in sections had been historically straightened. And this restoration will eventually return the sinuosity to that section of Silverbrook, which had been missing. And that sinuosity, that curvature, um, will slow storm velocity and halt erosion. And then the um, third major component of the restoration was to increase wetland and vernal pool habitat at the site by creating um, many hundreds of thousands of additional square feet of um, vernal pool habitat. And all of those activities took place over four months in 2020 and were um, commented by the NRCS as one of the most effective restorations that they had done. In fact, we actually toured the almost the entire staff of the DP um, to the property to show how effective that restoration had been. And so um, the restoration that took place was limited to when it could occur because of the existence of wood turtle on the site. In fact, the picture on the left here is a turtle found, um, an adult turtle found by us actually during a corporate work day on um, June 2011. And, and those um, data were shared with the Natural Heritage Database so that it could be documented that um, wood turtle is at the site. It's a critical nesting habitat for wood turtle, which as you can see, um, requires aquatic habitats at various parts of its life cycle during mating, feeding, and, and the, the several times we've found wood turtles, they're often moving around um, ditches and wet spots throughout the property. So we believe that these water quality and water quantity changes that this proposed development um, will um, have happened at CMA um, are really going to lead to increased scouring along those banks that we've been working so hard to protect, to increased erosion and siltation in our section downstream um, from the proposed development. So all those hard wrought improvements to the CMA we fear will be undermined by these changes to water quality and water quantity that we believe will result from the development. So as, as Steve mentioned, even um, 
you know, even implementing New Jersey DEP's, you know, BMP stormwater practices as you're replacing forest with hardscape and lawn, the total volume of runoff produced in every rainfall event will increase and head downstream to our CMA. And that, um, that expected increased volume um, is really going to cause and undermine some of the progress that we feel we've made at the site. But the other piece of it, as Steve mentioned, is all this amazing vernal pool habitat that we have created and enhanced over um, the last several years, um, over 320,000 feet, square feet of vernal pool habitat. Um, because the um, proposal will not recharge the surficial aquifer, we're gonna expect that these vernal pools will see altered base flow. And vernal pools, if you know, are fed only by surface waters and by um, you know, high water table, they're not fed by permanent streams. So we're gonna expect alterations and, and indeed reduction in um, the base flow and therefore um, the water levels in these vernal po pools, causing them to potentially dry out more quickly and conversely be subjected to increased flooding after heavy rains as more volume hits um, our property. So the Silverbrook's already a very flashy stream um, with water levels rising quickly after rain events because of existing upstream impervious cover. And so increasing that impervious cover uh, further can only make this, this flashiness and the problems that we see at the CMA um, along the Silverbrook worse. So while the, the hearing, as Elliot carefully pointed out and Steve has reiterated, while that Ma March 9th hearing is specifically to address the amendment to the Northeast Water Quality Management Plan as needed to expand the, the sewer service area map, the downstream volume increases and the water quality impacts uh, of expected increase in total suspended solids to the Silverbrook are really concerning to us. And since the DP regulations only require a reduction in total suspended solids of 80% post-development, as Steve mentioned, um, with the, the current forested conditions being supplanted by development, um, there's no currently no suspended solids being produced on this parcel. Um, so post-development, even in the best case scenario, there will be an increase of pollutants reaching the CMA. Um, We've been monitoring, as Steve mentioned and Sandra will reiterate, we have have underlying water chemistry that we've been taking at the site for many years. Um, and we're, you know, looking in the current um, situation with this restoration for improvements in water quality. And our fear is that if this proposed development goes ahead, we're going to see a reversal in those improvements that we're starting to see. So I'm gonna pass it along to um, Sandra and she can talk a little bit more about the water quality issues. Yeah. Okay, thank you everyone as we uh, work through our technical challenges here. Um, as Hazel mentioned, my name is Sandra Levine, and I'm the Director of Water Quality uh, for the Great Swamp Watershed. Um, just going to share my screen here. I have a minute to get this started from the beginning. All right. So there we go. So I'm going to talk about the data that we have and the potential impacts um, that we could expect to our waterways. And one of the things that's been brought up, and I just want to clarify because it's um, some of the technical jargon that we often use um, as we're discussing our data. But so we talked a number of times about the hydrologic units um, or the HUCs um, and the HUC 14s. What that is, is a breakdown of the water, the sub watersheds within a greater area. So the overall area is the Great Brook Passaic River watershed. And that watershed is like a bathtub. It's an area where all of the runoff and the rain that falls within that region goes to one outlet. In your bathtub, it would be your drain. In this instance, it is ultimately the Passaic River. 
um, the impacts from this development are going to specifically um, touch two of the, the Huck 14 sub watersheds within that greater area. So if you look at the map on your screen, we have two um, Huck 14s outlined. We have the Great Brook um, sub watershed above uh, Green Village Road. And that's outlined to the north and the west in orange and to the east and the south, I mean, in yellow and to the east and the south in orange and red. Within that, you can see the uh, blue streaks, which are the rivers, both the Great Brook, which starts up here, as well as the Silver Brook, which starts and comes down past the proposed development property. That little orange triangle that you see is where the development would be proposed. The other Huck 14 sub watershed um, that will be impacted by this proposal is the Lewantica Brook sub watershed. And the reason for that is that the proposed amendment to the sewer service area will add these 96 um, condos to the woodland wastewater treatment plant located within the Lewantica subwatershed, marked on the map by the small red dot. Um, and that will effectively add 27,000 gallons per day to the woodland wastewater treatment plant, effluent which will be released directly into Lewantica Brook. So it will also change the hydrology in that area as well. So I just want to talk a little bit about where we collect our data so that you have some idea. I have two pretty simple Google Maps here. The one on the left is our sampling sites for Lewantica Brook. We have historic data for all of the sites that are marked along that. We're gonna talk tonight about data from LB5, which is at the top. That site is just off of Woodland Ave um, and above the Woodland Wastewater Treatment Plant Outfall, which is marked on the map in brown. And we're gonna talk about LB2, which is our sampling site just below Kitchell Pond. Um, right at the outfall of the dam below the pond. In the Silver Brook, which again in the plans um, submitted to DEP is marked as Catfish, Catfish Brook, um, we have two main sampling sites, SB1 and SB3. Those are both within the conservation management area. We've also added the three culverts that come across 287. Culvert 3 is the actual cul culvert where the Silverbrook passes under 287. Culvert 2 and Culvert 1 are culverts that pull drainage from the wetlands on the other side of 287 within the 15 acre um, parcel that they're looking to amend with the proposed development. Um, and they come directly into the CMA. So I wanna talk again about the current state of our streams. Under the Clean Water Act, as Steve mentioned, um, New Jersey DEP in 2020 submitted their most um, up-to-date list, 303D list of impaired waters. And what that means is that through sampling um, results submitted from water quality agencies like GSWA, as well as collected um, by the USGS and New Jersey DEP, they put all of this data together and they assess each water body in terms of its impairments, in terms of where it does not meet the standards for either the New Jersey DEP water quality standards or the EPA standards. Um, Lewantica Brook is considered impaired as a drinking water site for aquatic life and for swimming, boating, and fishing. Um, the issues which are putting it on those impaired lists um, have to do with bacteria and other microbes such as cyanobacteria, um, degraded aquatic life, which can be fish and the aquatic macroinvertebrates or the insects that live um, within the waters. It's impaired due to excessive nitrogen and phosphorus, and it's impaired due to salts, which are measured as total dissolved solids. Um, so this is the most recent um, sampling data that GSWA has collected in 2022. And the uh, numbers marked in red are all of the exceedances of those parameters um, according to New Jersey DEP or the EPA. 
So nitrogen is well over the standard, which is um, one milligram per liter. Um, you can see that on every sampling date at every site, um, Luanica Brook already exceeds that um, parameter. Phosphorus is lower upstream at that LB5 site above the wastewater treatment plant and higher at LB2, which is the site directly downstream from Kitchell Pond, which is just downstream from the outlet from the wastewater treatment plant. As you go further downstream and the stream has gone through other wetland areas, um, as well as forested areas, those numbers begin to decrease. Um, total dissolved solids, salts, also in exceedance, um, they're actually highest um, above the wastewater treatment plant in the more urbanized area um, where there are more road salt issues. So we can see through this data that, um, that DEP regulations are not being met already. So what this means is that as the amount of effluent is being added to woodland wastewater treatment plant, there will be more volume coming through this system and that can be um, additive, as Steve mentioned, to the potential for algal blooms within Kitchell Pond itself and downstream of that area. Um, the numbers that you see for total phosphorus at LB2, which are very representative of the water within Kitchell Pond, are all orders of magnitude higher than the amounts required to stem an algal bloom during the growing season. Um, so, you know, as little as 0 0.04 can be enough to promote um, algal blooms within the system. And here we have numbers of 0 0.12, 0 0.19, so much higher than what's necessary. Um, so this can have an impact not only on the aquatic life and the macroinvertebrates, um, but also um, on the uses, the, the recreational uses of the pond itself and allowing it to be safe for the community as a resource. We move over to the state of the streams in the Silver Brook and Great Brook. We see again that New Jersey lists that area, that Huck 14 subwatershed, as impaired. Here it's specifically impaired for aquatic life and swimming, boating, and fishing. So the numbers that you see on the screen for the GSWA data is our macroinvertebrate or our biological aquatic life survey that we conduct within all the streams in the watershed. And you can see as we have data from for Great Brook from 2018, 2019, and 2020, and we are seeing progressively higher numbers which is excellent. So we're, pro we're progressing, we're seeing an improvement in the aquatic life, but those poor and fair values are still below the attainment numbers for non-impaired waters in, by New Jersey DEP. In Silverbrook, prior to our restoration in 2020, we were considered very poor um, with a high gradient uh, macroinvertebrate index, which is the index that we use to produce these values. It's used throughout New Jersey. And that number was 16 for the Silver Brook in 2020. In 2021, just one year after our restoration took place, we had already seen um, a significant improvement um, of 19.5. Uh, I did just get the 2022 results in. I did not have time to include them in my slide but we have seen another improvement and we're up um, above 20 now. Um, so we're seeing considerable improvement within those streams. The upstream planned development could have a significant negative impact on those numbers. When Hazel was talking about the number of total dissolved solids coming down due to runoff from the impervious surfaces, um, increased overall volume of flow, we can see scouring and erosion of the streams. And what that does is it increases the total suspended solids. So it increases the amount of particles in the water that as the water slows down, as it begins to level off through the Great Swamp, uh, through the CMA, um, those particles fall out and they fill in the cracks of the bottom of the stream, which is that habitat that we have just worked to improve. So those total suspended solids could have a severe and significant negative impact on our macroinvertebrate populations at the CMA. So 
I'm going to finish with um, just a slide. I am not going to read all of these, but I wanted them on the record um, for um, when we submit the slideshow to you for comment to DEP through written comments, as well as, um, you know, through any verbal comments that someone might wish to make. Um, these are two surface water quality standards. Um, 79B, um, 15A number two um, is a statement of policy that says that New Jersey DEP is committed to the enhancement of its waters and that none of the state's population, regardless of economy or status, have the right to abuse or degrade those waters. The second standard there is from the anti-degradation policies that Steve mentioned before. This is for category two waters, which impaired waters um, fall into. And what this is, is it says that even though the waters are degraded, no one has the right to further degrade them. And we do, we do feel that the development of this policy and the inclusion of the extra effluent into Luantica Brook would cause these Luantica Brook to be further degraded. And we feel that the development itself will have um, a, impacts on the downstream Silver Brook or Catfish Brook as well. So these two standards are, sta are points to to talk about when you're mentioning to DEP, when you are submitting to DEP your comments. So we do encourage, we are so thankful and grateful that we have had such a wonderful turnout this evening. And we do encourage everyone to submit written comments to the DEP. And I'm gonna turn it over to Sally and she is going to explain how to do that um, as well as when. All right. Thanks, Sandra. Thanks, Hazel. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Elliot. Thank you all for joining us this evening. I hope you realize, <clears throat> excuse me, what an important issue this indeed is. Um, so I have the logistic information to share with you. You will be able to register for the DEP hearing, which is being held on March 9th, one day in advance of the hearing. Unfortunately, that's all they do. So you can register for the hearing as of March 8th, <clears throat> on the screen, we have the uh, website address where you can go to register. We're going to be sharing the entire recording. We're going to be sharing the slides. We're going to be posting this information on our website. And <clears throat> excuse me, when the registration becomes available, we will be posting that information uh, on our website as well. Uh, please register to attend even if you do not plan on speaking. You don't have to speak to participate. It is important for DEP to see as many people on as possible so they realize how important this issue is to multiple people, not just a couple. Um, if you do plan on speaking though, please um, indicate that when you do register. And if you do want to speak and you indicate that, you will also have to specify the program interest and activity number, which is also on the slide in red right there. You need to tell them what it is you're going to be speaking on. Um, if you do wish to speak, you will probably be limited to two minutes. Keep in mind, that's not a very long time. Uh, you'll just state your name and the town you're from, and then just go directly to your environmental issue. Don't talk about you know the pretty birds that live in your backyard. Uh, they just want you to get right to the point. Um, please limit your comments to environmental issues. We realize as with many developments, different people have different concerns, including things like lights, traffic, noise, and environmental justice issues. Those are not the issues that are being heard by DEP at this hearing. So please try to limit your concerns to very specific environmental water quality and water quantity um, issues. Uh, we also encourage you to please submit written comments to the DEP and the information on how to do that is there on the screen as well. You can send them an old fashioned snail mail letter, a very long address. Please make sure you write the very specific address on your envelope so it gets to the right place. Obviously, if you are so inclined, it is much uh, easier to submit um, an email comment. Again, please 
the more comments that DEP receives, the more weight they will be given. If they understand that this is an important issue to many people, it really has an impact with DEP. Please put the issues in your own language. Of course, if you have any questions, we are happy to assist you or to answer them. Our top issues are on, I believe, the next slide. There we go. Those are the top issues that we have addressed this evening. Certainly, if you have another issue that is of concern and relevance to you, please feel free to, to share that as well. But these are the top issues, and you know, hopefully this is kind of boiled down from a lot of stuff that, that you listened to tonight, and it, we, we realized we were throwing a lot of information at you. Um, so I think we're now going to go to questions from the chat if there weren't, if there were or are any. Um, if you haven't yet put a question in the chat, this is your opportunity to do so. And, um, you know, depending on who it's for, we'll have Steve or Elliot or Hazel or Sandra available to answer those questions. Um, and as I said, if you do have any questions later or you're shy and you don't want to ask them now, um, there, those are our uh, names and email addresses here at Great Swamp, and we will be happy to help you. This is a really important issue to all of us, and um, we want DEP to hear from everyone. So now I'm going to go back to the staff and say if there's any questions in the chat, this is the opportunity for um, them to get answered. Again, thank you so much for your time. Let's see. It's 8.06, so, so we were pretty close to, to an hour. Um, but you know, thank thank you for your time and attention. I'm sorry, I'm also getting text there is a question. Message. Yeah, if if anybody Somebody has asked, questions um, afterwards, you is it welcome is this a potential for acquisition? Um, and would you need a willing seller? Um, and would the appraised value be less if a water quality management plan expansion was denied? So I, I don't actually know the answer to that question. That's obviously not um, what's on the books right now, but that's the question that came in. It would be worth more if it's approved. Mm -hmm. But yeah, the first part of that question is you have you have to have a willing seller. Um, and another question is that. Um, it's my understanding that the any modifications to the water quality management plan and component water management plan require the endorsements of the governing bodies and administrative authorities, the boards of health of both Morris and Harding. So the development itself is taking place in Harding. The access road is through Morris. Um, do you know, it, have any of those government agencies weighed in on the issue? I don't think I we do, know the answer to that. I, don't think I, I do know. I, I do know that that is required. Plus, the county has to approve as well. Um, but I, I don't know. It should be in the in the file. Um, but um, they're, they're required. But I haven't seen the the approvals. Okay. All right. Well, if anybody has um, any other follow up questions, um, you're welcome to uh, email them to us. I, I, there were a number of questions that yep. were direct message to me. Okay. Um, if you want me, I'll, I'll read them. There's, I think there's a couple here that are more applicable to like you or Sally answering them. But uh, the first is uh, from Mary Pendergast. And it's essentially what will the effect of the development be on the underground aquifer? As Elliot pointed out, we're already in a deficient area. Uh, meaning that there's more water being drawn from the aquifer than is being replaced. Uh, so that is, you know, the goal is really to have that balanced out so that there's enough, uh, you know, potable water supply. Um, so, uh, and it's, I, I guess, like the simplest way to look at that is that currently right now, the development is located within a uh, area of a known uh, groundwater supply deficiency. My focus was more on the impact to the um, to the stream and the health of that stream, but um, I'm not sure if uh, Elliot, you wanted. Uh, uh, well, yeah, I mean, there. If if this was if the wastewater was being returned, um, if it was being discharged to the same sub watershed, 
that would be a, a much better situation. Uh, but they're actually taking it, you know, at 49,000 gallons per day, transferring it to another sub watershed. That's a depletive use and it will exacerbate the current deficit. And that should be avoided. Right. And the second part of that question is that, you know, how may it affect uh, wells in Harding Township that, re, you know, rely on, uh, right, on groundwater. So um, it, it, it could have a, a, a direct impact. Uh, another question was any particular language that should be used in the subject line of an email going to DEP. Sally, do you want to handle that one? Uh, I believe that the, the subject line should include, uh, can we go to that other screen that had in red? No, that one, program interest and activity number so that it's associated with the right file. Sally, there's another question I think is more appropriate for you to answer than I, and that is, is there a goal in mind? Well, in an ideal world, we wouldn't have the property be developed. Um, sh short of that, I suppose we would like to see a significant reduction in impervious surface and um, better handling of stormwater uh, retention and um, Right, particularly in terms of the ability to, you know, recharge to the maximum capacity uh, available on that site. Uh, and granted, it does have its limitations. However, uh, it doesn't mean that it's happening now. It doesn't mean that it can't happen in the future. And, and to reduce volume, and there are mechanisms by which volume can be reduced. So, uh, yeah, that would be uh, a goal. Another question is why did it take so long for Great Swamp to get involved? I think okay. we don't understand we've been I, I involved think, for a long time. <laughs> I, I think we were waiting for this one. So the um, development was proposed in Harding and uh, through a calamity of errors, I think everyone in Harding that knows and works closely with Great Swamp assumed that somebody else told us the development was being proposed. And since we weren't commenting that we had no objection to it, Unfortunately, what happened was everybody thought someone else was letting us know, and so no one let us know. So we were not aware of the development proposal when it went to the appropriate board. When it went to Morris Township, someone from Morris Township did indeed let us know, and that's the time that we immediately got involved. Um, to be honest, I don't know that we would have had much of an impact in Harding, but of course it would have been better if we could have tried. Uh, but our issues are very specifically environmental. And so I feel that the DEP is an appropriate venue for us to um, you know, make our comments. There was somebody, Steve, I don't know if there's more questions, but I did see somebody like do that raise hand thing. So I don't know how we let him ask his question, but Steve, why don't you finish with anybody else who, who asked you? A couple more. I think, I think, you know, somebody noted that, you know, uh, there was some kind of like direct set, uh, some kind of setup so that the direct message was only coming to me. But yeah. I think that may just be a function of Zoom. And that was not, I was surprised to see direct messages come to me, to be quite honest with you, uh, I'd be quite honest. Um, and a couple of other quick ones, uh, uh, Sally, uh, has there ever been a development in a similar location close to the conservation area? Uh, and if so, what kind of specific impacts uh, were experienced? So I've been here 15 years and I, I don't believe there's been a development certainly so close in proximity upstream to us. Obviously that corporate complex was built, but I think that was either late seventies or early eighties. So that was even before we acquired the properties on Tiger Lily Lane. Um, I don't believe there has been another development that has the potential to so directly impact our property. Although many of you know that when we come across a development that has environmental impacts, whether it affects us, Great Swamp Watershed directly, owned property directly or not, if we feel that it impacts the watershed, um, you know, we certainly do comment. And some of you maybe remember, we actually do comment in favor of developments when we think they're making improvements as well. And one final question is that um, somebody wanted clarification in terms of the water quality improvements that Sandra had noted. Uh, down uh, that you know downstream 
uh, were they related to the work done at the CMA? So basically, you guys had before and after. Yeah, the, uh, the answer is yes. But Sandra or Hazel, are you guys going to unmute so you can answer that directly? Sure. So the restoration, while long in the planning, was only carried out in 2020. Um, so the restoration was finished in the late fall of 2020. So we're really only two years post that. And in terms of restoration, two years is not a long time. Um, NRCS would expect for us to see the site still settling down for three to five years and for the types of improvements to take, you know, eight to 10 years to start to really show. But the fact that we, in the second year, were already seeing improvements, um, two years in a row, we're already seeing improvements in the macroinvertebrates at the site, which was, um, you know, an intentional um, addition of macroinvertebrate habitat and um, changes in siltation, you know, and, and movement of sediments through this, the Silver Brook. Um, the fact that we're seeing them so quickly, we would expect the trajectory to continue to um, improve without this, without this proposed development. Um, so I think Steve, what happened is, is uh, all the, all the hosts got, um, got random messages if you were speaking and the message came in, it went to you. So um, somebody some of asked- coming in, Some of them are coming <laughs> in right now. Okay. <laughs> coming to you. Well, so thanks the, for moderating, um, Steve. Yeah, so this is a pretty lengthy one. I think there's some, I think one of you guys need to address this, but have we engaged the Morris, uh, the Morris Township Committee and Harding Township's government? Morris Township approved the sewer connection and negotiated the egress and ingress over the office complex property. That was a question. Jeff Grazel was on the committee during the approval process and Kathy Wilson has been active in bringing attention to the negative impact the Fair Share Housing Association has on forcing municipalities to develop properties like these. In addition, the Harding Township Committee has unsuccessfully sued to stop a forced development. So I think it's At the a end of the question. question in okay. a statement. Okay. And the sec the second question is in the oh, wait, can you do them one at, can you do them one at a time to for me so I don't have to yeah I think I, so I think the primary question was has Great Swamp engaged Morris Township committee in the Harding Township's government? Okay, so first of all, let me be very clear: Great Swamp Watershed Association is not anti affordable housing. We're not anti-housing in general. We're certainly not anti-affordable housing. We just feel that it needs to be done in an environmentally appropriate manner. And we don't think that this site is appropriate for that development. Um, the other question is, no, we have not worked with Harding Township. As I previously said, unfortunately, they had already approved the development when we were made aware of it. We have um, spoken at the Morris Township hearings. Unfortunately, there. Um, application was very limited specifically to the access to the property. The, the development is not occurring on Morris Township property. It's only the access to the project. So while we tried to speak at those hearings, it, it really was not um, helpful. Okay, I guess Sandra can see these questions now. So she's going to take over. <laughs> Right. So then the other question of that person was, yeah, what is the thing to stop the project from moving forward? What is the one thing? Right. So what's the silver bullet, essentially? And that was a, that was a so question. For I would... That's a great swamp. I would say that the main uh, best practice to help us stop this is exactly what we're talking about this evening. Um, if we can bring our environmental concerns to the DEP um, in an educated uh, way through emails, as well as through people speaking at the meeting on March 9th, um, that will be our best 
um, and most effective way to bring our concerns to them and to hopefully stop the potential development. Wouldn't it be great if there was a silver bullet, but it's going to be harder work than that. There's a, there's a confluence of, of, of abuses in, in that will occur to the, to the water quantity and quality that are many, many, many that have to be addressed. Uh, but there's not some big silver bullet that we can just deliver to kill it. It's going to take a lot of people commenting and expressing substantive concerns. You know, I don't want to speak on behalf of Harding Township because I don't live in Harding and I'm certainly not involved in a, any Harding planning board or township committee, but my, I believe that their primary concern is that they need a location for affordable housing. I, I, I believe that there are other locations in Harding that would probably be feasible and have less of an environmental impact. And I would uh, encourage Harding to consider looking at some of these other options if, if this is indeed um, defeated or, or a minimum reduced. All right, thank you everyone for joining. Again, we will be sending out these slides and have all the resources you need to sign up and send comments also on our website. So if you need any of those after the fact, after this webinar is over, um, you can go ahead and go to greatswamp.org and you'll be able to find all that information or um, contact us through, um, we have all that information, our contact info also on our staff page on our website. We'll be happy to help you send those comments. And thank you for attending. Thank, thank you night. for your interest. There are over 100 people really means a lot. We appreciate it.